I have uh, snuck something in on you today. I've called it the parable of the second mile. My wife reminds me that this is probably not a parable. Uh, but we're going to make a lesson out of it anyway that fits right into the parables. And the fact that it has a, a deeper meaning than what you see on, on the surface. It was something that was uh, that we have been taught about for many years as sitting in Bible classes and also from sermons. But I, I think that as we get a little further into the lesson that you'll understand why I consider it a, a parable. It's not on that list of 52 that I gave you. Uh, and uh, I had my hand called on that earlier when I put it in the wrong place and, and said the next week was going to be this one. And, but I had it scheduled for a little bit later. It's also interesting to notice that it is not easy at first glance to make to 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 give people a a full and complete definition of Christianity. Uh, many people think of Christianity as far as church buildings are concerned. Some think of it as as somebody who is piously in, in prayer. But to offer a full and complete definition of Christianity is really not easy. Uh, if you're talking to a person that doesn't know about God or doesn't know about Jesus Christ, and they say, well, what is Christianity? You say, well, it's, it's my relationship to God and to Jesus. And they look at you like, what do you mean? You know, they have no concept of what you're talking about. And they're getting to be more and more people like this in the world because of our day and time's rejection of what they call organized religion. And I guess what they want is unorganized religion of some sort. Basically what they want is to do their own thing, their own way, whenever they want to. And that's, that's their religion. And they have a hard time conceiving what Christianity really is versus what we see in the world today in, in what is called organized religion. But I would say that Christianity is a whole lot like a diamond that has many different facets. And the designs of Christianity are so multiform and varied that it has to be viewed from every direction in order to see everything and to see the splendor of what Christianity is really all about. Technically, Christianity is the perfect plan for the redemption of mankind from sin. And you say, well, well, why does man need to be redeemed from sin? And the reasoning lies behind the fact that our God is a holy God and He expects us to be like Him. And what this is in this life, that this is a training time. This is a preparation time to get us ready to be able to go to heaven. In Romans, the first chapter in verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about Jesus that we have to preach, that we have to share, that we have to tell people in order for them to understand what Christianity is about, what Jesus has done for them, and what He has done in relationship to unite us once again with God. What really happens is that Christianity contemplates the taking of man and woman and making them fit for the company of angels and redeemed spirits. Now I use that phrase because I don't know who all or what all is in heaven. All I know is that there is a plan for us and that's what we're supposed to follow, and that's what we're supposed to do in, in life. Christianity is designed to subdue man's wild and reckless spirit and to purge us from our carnal and worldly nature and to bring our will and our disposition into a complete and perfect harmony with God. What does that mean? That it shapes us, it changes us, and that's what the conversion uh, concept means when it talks about you be converted to Jesus Christ. 
It changes us into what God wants us to be, not what we are demanding of ourselves or what others demand of us, but what God demands of us. And, and all of this and, and a lot more, I think, is involved in the system of grace, which is so wonderfully provided for us today. And, and it's deeper. Uh, I started a study several years ago, haven't finished it, need to go back to it, that is entitled Water Ski Religion. And the picture on the front of it shows this guy on water skis, and it shows a submarine that's down below because many times all that we ever get is sort of like skipping a rock on top of the water. It's there until it finally gets to the end, and then it sinks. And Christianity is deeper than just the surface that most people actually touch in their whole lives. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 5, even when we were dead in sins, He has changed us, He has quickened us, He has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Now think about this for just a minute. Think about the disastrous consequences that would inevitably follow if God just suddenly snatched us all up and arbitrarily transplanted us into heaven while we were still in our carnal and fallen state. Do you think heaven would be what we think heaven is supposed to be like? I, I, I think that if you did that, heaven would be an awful lot, if not exactly like, what we've got now. Uh, we would have neighbors that we probably couldn't get along with. We would have neighbors that were always disturbing us. We would have communities in which there was chaos, like what happened in Orlando last night uh, when the fellow shot and killed 20 people and wounded 40-something others. Uh, why does that go on? It's because there is not the love of Christ in the hearts of individuals like the man that was the shooter. If we were unfitted such, for such an association, if God sent us on to heaven and just took us out of our element right now like we really are, I think it would only result in misery and wretchedness for both him and other inhabitants of heaven. People would be miserable. They would be bored. They would be unhappy. And first of all, God doesn't expect that for us. God isn't providing that for us. And such an arbitrary dealing with mankind would be really most unkind. The Lord will never thrust a human being into a state that he does not want and for which he is not prepared. I'm going to make that statement again because I want that one really to sink in. The Lord will not put man into a state which he does not want and for which he is not prepared. Now that's kind of different from the way that our world is thinking today. Our world actually thinks, well, God is not going to punish anybody. God is not going to send anybody to hell. Everybody, regardless of what they think and how they behave, that God is going to accept them and everybody's going to go to heaven. Oh, 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 oh spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what God says. And so we have to convince people that they have to listen to what God says to make this change in life. Uh, we choose where we're going to end up. And, and I also we have to remember, and you've probably heard this statement many, many times over many years, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Jesus says, I'm going to heaven to be with my Father to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, you can be there with me. So I, I really don't understand why people have this concept in their mind that God's going to save everybody. And, and yet it persists today and probably is a little more persistent today than it ever has been in any time any time since Christianity was established. But you have to remember that only those who successfully serve their apprenticeship here on this earth and they finish their preparation are going to be permitted to pass through the gates of the city four square. 
Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to reach a state of perfection on your own and what you do, but our state of perfection is going to be because we're compliant to what Christ has taught us and what God wants us to be according to His Word. Now, if we are in that state of grace because we have been obedient to the Word of God, then everything's okay. You don't have to worry about dying. The time will come in which you're going to die. And whether it's a violent death or whether it's a very peaceful death, when you've got your family all assembled around you and you just breathe your last and you're gone, it doesn't make any difference if you're prepared, if you're ready, if you are in compliance with God's Word. It's okay. It's great. It's wonderful. It's just the next step into the next realm of our life which is going to last for an eternity. 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 since, says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and making holiness perfect in the fear of God. This is what the whole purpose of our assembly is, is to help us to get ready to and be prepared to go out into the world and to fight against those things that are going to make us less than what God wants us to be. It is interesting that people that don't do this are mercifully going to be shut out because they would be a hindrance to us in heaven. They would be a difficulty for us. And the Lord is not going to force an intolerable situation upon anyone. They say, well, people don't want to go to hell. God's going to... No, they're choosing to go to hell. God has said, here are, are two, two places you can go after you die. You can go to heaven or you can go to hell. And you choose. God doesn't make you do anything. You are here because you chose to be here. You are a Christian because you decided that you needed to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. You are a servant of God because you want to be a servant of God. We always have to remember that we choose ourselves where we will and what we want to spend eternity. Now, I don't know where this sign was put up. Probably outside some church someplace. <laughs> but it certainly reflects the concept of deciding what, we, what we're going to decide for ourselves by the way that we live. Now, as we continue in these great teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, we have to remember that the Sermon on the Mount deals with the, at length with the motives and dispositions that always characterize the children of God. And it offers a rule by which we can measure ourselves. And it's also a way in which we can put aside the weaknesses of our humanity and shine forth as worthy citizens in the kingdom of God. And as such, Christianity is a definite advance beyond the imperfect concepts which were set forth among the Jews prior to the coming of Jesus. How many times... Did Jesus say, or how many times do you read in the Scripture that Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, the law of Moses as administered by the rabbis and our Savior in, in Jesus' day took recognition only of the actual or the overt act of sin itself. In Matthew 5, 27 through 28, Jesus says, You have heard that it said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone that looks on a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, that's pretty extensive. That deals more when the, it, than just the act itself. Even the shooter that we mentioned a while ago down in Orlando that killed 20 people and wounded 40-something others. The thing that they're doing now is trying to figure out why did he do that? Why did he do that? The motive behind it. You see, the teaching of Jesus went beyond 
the act of the sin and it regulated the motive, the heart of itself. He says the heart is the problem. The heart is the problem that we have, and we have to change our heart. It is the heart of the problem. Jesus' law not only sees the deed, but it probes for the will and the disposition that prompts us why we did something. The law forbade a person to kill another, to commit murder. The Bible says in Matthew 5 and 22, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of those of ancient times, you shall not murder. But whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say unto you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to hellfire. Jesus digs down into the depth of problems as the fact is that if we love people, we're not going to offend them verbally. How hard is that? <laughs> it is tremendously hard. What and how do we respond to people when they say something bad at us or to us? We, we want to say something on a higher level than that. We want to get above them. We want to really rip them apart. And how many of us are willing to say, well, God bless you, and walk away? You see, the, the parables include a lot of things like if somebody smites you on the cheek to turn the other cheek to. Oh, man, that's hard to do. I had a fellow tell me one time when I was teaching on this, he said, you know, I know the Bible says if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn to the left cheek. He says, but then the third lick belongs to me. Isn't that, isn't that the concept of the world? We'll take what God says in His Word and we'll change it to make it like I want it to be. The concept of killing a person. Jesus says it's not just the killing of a person, but it's the attitude that we have toward brothers and sisters. And it, the problem is our heart. How do we feel about it? Jesus added this sin of being angry with one's brother without a cause. He said that personal revenge was forbidden. Boy, we need to think of that a little bit more. He also made resistance to evil equally sinful. Adultery has always been prohibited, and Jesus condemns the look of lust that precedes it. To, to illustrate the disposition or the character or attitude of heart of the children of God, Jesus offers three illustrations. One of those, as we just mentioned, are like being struck on the cheek. Uh, generally, that's sort of saying, that's the way that I've been insulted by you. Back during the time in which duels took place, uh, that's the way you started a duel. You took your glove off, which we don't wear gloves like that much anymore, and you took it and you struck your opponent in the face and you says, I challenge you to a duel, you have insulted me. And they go out in the back and they, one may shoot the other one or both, of, both may shoot each other. Or if they're really lucky, neither one of them is a good shot and both of them walk away. But what does this mean to us? Uh, Jesus is saying you need to think about this. Another problem is being sued at law. What do we want to do? We want to have a countersuit. We're going to challenge. How many of you like to watch Judge Judy? You know, people, families suing each other. There was one yesterday in what a, what a mother was suing her son, and the son had a countersuit against his mother. And Judge Judy said, why are you all here? This is a family matter. And she was right. And the third illustration, he says, being compelled to go a mile against our will. Have you ever been challenged to do something you really didn't want to do, but you felt like you had to do it? I think all of us have been put in that situation. It might have been a family member. It might have been something that needed to be done. Uh, it might have been on your job. It might have been in a lot of different places in which 
we were put in a situation in which we had to do something that we really didn't want to do. But we did it anyway. In Matthew, the fifth chapter in verse 41, Jesus says, Whosoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him the second mile. Have you ever thought about this word compel? Make, demand, enforce? You really don't have a choice in it, do you? But you have to do it anyway. Uh, we're going to look at only one of these beautiful illustrations that becomes the title of our lesson, which is the parable of the second mile. Being compelled or forced to go a mile against one's will. And this passage that we've just read in Matthew 5, 41. Whosoever shall compel you to go one mile, go with him too. Oftentimes, we may get very tired of doing some things that are really expected of us. And Jesus says that there is a problem of the heart when this comes along. And we're going to deal with that in the rest of this lesson. The Roman government had adopted a practice that originated with the Persians. And that was forcing private citizens into governmental service against their will. Uh, this meant that a soldier or maybe a tax collector or somebody in government service was traveling from one town to another or from one appointment to another appointment, taking their belongings along with them, if they found somebody working in the field or somebody even that was taking care of their sheep, could say to them, come here, I need you to carry my pack for a mile. And the law said they had to do that. Now, any representative of the government having transacted his business and locally might need transportation, transportation to the next community. And so a citizen would be compelled to provide the necessary transportation or at least the carrying of their pack or the carrying of their belongings. And this involved an interference with that individual's personal affairs. And that was especially galling and distasteful to the average Jew. First of all, these were their conquerors. Now they were living under a law in which it was not their law, but the Roman law. And besides, these were Gentiles on top of all of that. And so they were not real happy with that. In the first place, it was compulsory. And no ever, not, nobody ever likes to do that which they're forced to do. If you don't believe that's true, remember your children when you told them, go clean up your room or go walk the dog or whatever it might have been. Oh, do I have to? You know, you know we kind of still do that as adults, don't we? Further, the Jews considered the Romans as usurpers and the Jews longed for the day when their legions would be driven out of the land of Palestine. And this compulsory service from a source that was therefore exceedingly obnoxious to all patriotic citizens was something that they just totally detested. But it was Jesus who said, Whosoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him the second mile. That is being willing to do twice as much as is demanded or as expected. And that, I think, is the crux of the whole situation and why this is even inserted in the Scriptures. This is basically where we find what, is, what I call is the parable of the second mile. And there are four things that one has to do if you're going to live in a state of society. Now, if you want to live as, as a hermit, you may not have to do this. If you want to live as a loner out in the middle of the woods, 
Uh, I'm sure that some of you have seen some of these programs about these people that live out in the middle of, a, of nowhere in Alaska by themselves. Uh, that's fine, uh, but they have very little human contact, and it'll drive them nuts over a period of time. The first thing that you have to do is you have to either work or you starve. Now our society today has changed that considerably. Even the church here on Thursdays, we have a food program to feed people who may or may not be hungry. We have some people that are, are very gracious over what they receive. And at times, most of those people never really say anything like, hello, thank you, turn out the lights, turn on the lights, or, or anything to us, you know. They just come and get it and they leave. And even occasionally we have one that look in the bag and says, is that what I get this week, you know. And so we have to understand that there are different attitudes on that end of the stick also. You either work or you starve. The whole concept of working is part of what humanity is all about. Even when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, what did He do? He told them to do what? To dress it. I mean to work. Fix it. Repair it. Cultivate it. Work or starve. The second thing is to care for our family or suffer punishment or ostracism. Uh, there have been several cases in the news in recent weeks about families that have mistreated their children and they've gone to, to prison over it because society doesn't really condone that kind of thing. And even if there's no punishment about it, people are going to say, oh, what a terrible person they is. They don't even take care of their own family. And we may have actually more and more of that today than perhaps has ever existed. The third thing is living civilly in a community or we're going to be removed from society. Why do we have jails and prisons? We have jails and prisons because people won't behave themselves in the community. They if want a car, they'll steal a car. If they want uh, the money out of your house, they'll break in. If they want to sell your television and your radios and your telephones, uh, they'll break into your house and take those and sell them and do whatever they want to do, if it's drugs or, or whatever it might be that they're interested in doing. But if they're caught, we remove them from society. And hopefully, it gives them plenty of time to think about what they've done. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. The fourth thing is you either work or you lose your job. Years ago, when I worked for J.C. Penney Company, uh, one of my superiors hired a lady to run our peace goods department. And when she came in, she came in from another store, and I can understand why they would have been glad to sort of let her go for a while. She was what we called a merchandise patter. And what she would do, instead of straightening up merchandise, she'd stand next to a, 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 a counter where merchandise was and, and do this around the edges of it, instead of doing the actual work that was there. And, and she loved to stand there like this, until I had a little talk with her. And I told her, I said, you know, you're going to have to pull your weight, you're going to have to do your work, you're going to have to do your part in order for this floor to be, to be successful. And I said, if you're not willing to do that, I said, I know others that would be glad to have your job. She turned out to be a good peace goods lady because nobody had ever told her, you got to work. And she did a good job. And we are appreciative of the work that she did for us. You work or you lose your job. Right. And when, when you take on a job, 
you're given uh, given duties and expect and responsibilities and what you're expected to do and accomplish. And if you don't do that, what happens? After a period of time, they'll give you a chance to, to get it figured out. They give you a chance to improve. And if you don't, goodbye. We'll hire somebody else to take your job. All right. One is deserving of no commendation whatsoever, who is satisfied to give only the barest minimum of service. What do we do when only a bare minimum or only what is expected of us? What if we do only the bare minimum or only what is expected of us? We have to be, and we work sometimes to be exceeding caref exceedingly careful that we do no more than what we are required to do. And sometimes those younger workers that may not know say, well, I didn't know that's what you wanted me to do with that, you know, in addition. But that's not the Christian attitude. In Luke 17 and verse 9 and 10, Jesus says, Do you thank the slave for doing what he was commanded? So you also, when you've done all that you've been ordered to do, say, we're worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Jesus says the problem is the heart. The part of it that is what we consider our attitude or the lack of attitude. What would be thought of a person in determining the amount of money that he plans to spend on his wife and children, just measure it out to the very last penny of what is necessary to, to sustain their physical existence, and then takes care that he doesn't spend even a cent more. We'd call that person a miser, wouldn't we? We've already got a label for that individual. Uh, to keep them shoeless, to keep them in, in clothes that, that are not really the kind that you would want them out in, in society, to keep them from being part of society itself. You see, the Bible also addresses this in other places. Jesus, in Luke 14, 28 and 29 says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish. All who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and wasn't able to finish. When I was preaching and conducted weddings, uh, I'd got to the point where, except for a very few circumstances, I required premarital counseling before I would marry anybody. I wanted them to understand what marriage was about and their personal responsibilities as husband and wife to each other, to themselves. And, and sometimes, the people would get a little adamant against what I was saying because they didn't think that marriage was, was that. They didn't understand that it had to deal with rent and electricity and water bills that they had to pay. They thought, well, we just get an apartment. We live together. Big deal. you know. And after a while, they don't pay the rent and they move to another place. And after another while, they don't pay the rent and they live, move to another place. And there, we have a whole realm of society that lives like that today. They don't understand that they have to be or start preparing, look to the future, and work toward the future. Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy 8 and verse 5, Whoever does not provide for relatives, and especially for family members, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That kind of person would deserve and receive the condemnation of all good, good people. And yet, is this not the basis upon which many of us determine the amount of activity that we're going to engage in in the work of the Lord? Are not most of us content to do only what we absolutely have to do in order to be saved and no more? We, we kind of foster this attitude a person is baptized on Sunday morning. We say, well, we'll see you Wednesday night. What happened to Monday and Tuesday? And if they don't show up on Wednesday night because they're not used to going to worship services or to Bible study on Wednesday night, 
we say, oh, well, that person didn't really mean it anyway. And we just kind of dismiss our attitude, ourselves, and our responsibility in a new convert. Jesus taught us to say when we've done that which we ought to do, then we're still unprofitable servants. It teaches us that when we have done the bare stint of requirements and nothing more, we're still unprofitable servants. The servants who did their day's work in the field had only fulfilled their obligations. Who would say among you to your slave that's just come in from plowing or tending the sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Wouldn't you rather say to him, would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you can eat and drink? Do you thank the slave for doing what he is commanded? And so you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are unprofitable or worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The principle that we've shown here has many practical application. In fact, many brethren, for example, have concluded that there is only one essential meeting of the church, the Lord's Day morning assembly. And in a in an effort to sustain this view, they cite us, Hebrews 10, 20. Now, how many times have you heard preachers from the pulpit start pounding on this and said, you, you have, to, have to be there? As I examined the passage, I found that myself preaching that over the years, but have come to a different conclusion in all of this. To, uh, and what they say is, not neglecting the meeting, to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. To assume that this passage is an admonition to brethren to exhort one another to come together on the first day of the week is to miss the point completely. The brethren are commanded to assemble for the purpose of exhorting, not to exhort for the purpose of assembling. And the day contemplated here most likely was the impending destruction of Jerusalem. And we have oftentimes thought of that so well as we think of the, the judgment day coming. Well, is it possible that one can, can contend to go to the judgment as an unprofitable servant? The first mile we have already seen is the mile of compulsion, being forced. It does not ask, why must I do it? It rather says, what is there for me to do? And Jesus in our text pleads for the religion of the second mile. And those who travel that first mile are interested only in the stipend at the end of the journey. Those that we can throw it down and go back and do what we wanted to. And those who walk the second mile become sons whose chief end is to please him whom they serve. Not the person that they're carrying something for or doing something for, but in serving God and doing what we can to serve him. There are going to be a lot of things demanded of us in life that we may not want to do. I don't want you to be like this. I don't want you to be grumpy. Even of the expected things that we're to do, we should always do more than what is expected, and that's the way the Lord has taught us. The world would be impressed and possibly won over by our practicing in this simple life. First Peter two and, and uh, first, it's really First Peter two and twelve. I got that one wrong. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when He comes to judgment. In 1 Peter 3, 1, Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wives' conduct when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. It's a matter of the heart. How many times have you ever heard people say you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? It's not that we want to catch flies but that which is sweet and always more acceptable and peacemaking than defiance and reluctance will get the job done. We need to practice the religion of the second mile in our lives. Our next lesson is going to be the parable of the seed. We'll be dismissed for about 14 minutes. Thank you for your very kind attention today. We're through for right now.